Well, hello everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it's episode number 271 of Goulet Q&A, coming out to the end of October here of 2019. And I gotta say, this month has flown by, this year has flown by, really kind of freaking me out. But anyway, um, this past week had a really good time going back to my alma mater, Virginia Tech, for the first time in over 10 years. Uh, Rachel and I had not been back. We both graduated from there in 2006. We had not been back there since uh, we went to a Virginia Tech wine festival hosted there in the summer of 2009. This was before we started selling fountain pen stuff. We were still doing the Goulet Pen Company, but I was selling wooden wine bottle stoppers that we had licensed for Virginia Tech. Uh, or I should say I was making them. I wasn't really selling them. That was kind of an iconic time for us uh, because we went back to campus, kind of nostalgic and whatnot, uh, but we went to this wine festival and did not sell a single Virginia Tech wine bottle stopper as Virginia Tech alumni at a Virginia Tech wine festival on campus. That's when we knew we were like, we got to figure something else out. <laughs> It was the same, it was just so crazy at that time that just like all of our friends and family were like, that's such a great idea. You guys are gonna make a killing. We we're like, yeah, we are. And then we would actually go to sell the wares and people were like, nah, not so much. So formative time for us, but that was literally the last memory that we had of being back on that campus 10 years ago. So, I mean, our whole life has changed. We got into the fountain pen thing. We've had two kids and just so much else. So being back there, it was like, in some ways it was a flood of old memories. And in other ways, it was like, wow, so much has happened since then. Anyway, I'm sure a lot of y'all feel the same way if you've ever gone back to a place that you haven't been to in a very long time that was at a formative time in your life. I got to spend time on like the upper quad. I was in the Corps of Cadets. That's where all the cadets live is upper quad. Literally the dorm that I lived in has been torn down. They've built whole new ones. It's way nicer than when I was there. So I got a tour of the whole building. I got to speak to some cadets there. That's part of why we went. It was homecoming. We saw a football game and everything. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, definitely just crazy experience. Kind of a whirlwind driving there with our kids and everything. Whew. This was like coming off of my trip from Italy. And then we went to Rachel's parents house the previous weekend so we've been traveling so much we're just we're tired so we're excited now to be parking it for a while as we get into our busy season here at Goulet Pens. Uh, speaking of our busy season got some exciting stuff to talk about with you all I have like a zillion new products to talk about so I'm just gonna blow through a lot of them but before I do I want to talk about Fountain Pen Day because Friday next week November 1st the earliest day that Fountain Pen Day could be because it's always the first Friday of November it's kind of an unofficial holiday here within our pen community. Started out on the Fountain Pen Network back in 2012. Uh, Kerry Yeager is really the guy behind Fountain Pen Day. He now works at Kenro, which is the US distributor for Aurora, Montegrappa, Esterbrook, and a couple other brands. And so um, really is an enthusiast kind of grown holiday that we all get to celebrate. A lot of retailers have gotten on board with running deals and stuff like that. We are definitely gonna do that. I'm gonna talk more about that because it was a specific question for this Q&A, but I wanted to get it on your radar because you're gonna to start to see some talk about Fountain Pen Day. You're gonna see retailers promoting it, maybe getting some email newsletters from us and others. So um, be excited about that. Save up your pennies because you're gonna get some deals. Uh, some other things that we've launched, Drew and I did a right now earlier this week on Twisby Inc. So we are out of sets, at least as of the filming of this video, we're gonna to try to get more, um, but it's really cool little small bottles um, of these inks. We have a whole set and then we have individual ones. Um, more details on that in the right now if you wanted to see. They're fairly conventional inks, um, but frosted bottles, they look really nice. So I'm um, glad to see the Twisby's get into the ink game. Not that there's like a shortage of ink necessarily around, um, but I think they just, you know, as a pen company and a fairly established pen company at this point, they wanted to, um, you know, kind of make a statement with their ink. So um, it's been received pretty well so far. Uh, but that is something relatively new for us this week. Um, we do have the Peniter Forged Carbon Pen. Very cool material. Not going to show it here because Drew and I also did it right now on that on Wednesday. So you can check more about that in that right now if you're interested. But the material is really rad. Just go, you know, Wikipedia Forged Carbon or Forged Composite and you can read up some pretty cool stuff. Um, Galen Leather, so I talked about this a while ago. This was coming off of the DC Pen Show back in August. We immediately met with them. They 
were kind of making a big debut. They've been selling directly out of Turkey um, and largely to the U.S. market, honestly. And so they linked up with us and a couple of the U.S. retailers. Um, their supply is probably not going to be able to keep up with demand a little bit, especially as they're coming onto the scene. They were kind of the hot hot new thing to talk about at the DC Pen Show. And uh, a lot of people have been asking us questions about it. So we've been working with them literally ever since that day. And it's taken us until now to be able to offer them. So we have most everything. There's a couple things that we got back ordered on. It's gonna take a couple of weeks. We really debated, do we hold everything back to wait for things like the protractor and you know a couple little things here and there. We got most everything in, but it was like, no, nah, we're just gonna go ahead and list things. We're sorry if you're waiting on a couple of those things, but with, especially with Fountain Pen Day and some of those things, we, we didn't wanna miss all of that with the whole brand just because we're out of a couple products. This is how it goes sometimes when we're carrying new brands. They are trying to meet their demand. I would not be shocked if the writing boxes sell out very quickly because that seems to be part of the hot thing and it's definitely unique to what they do that we ordered a ton. We got shorted because they literally have to make them. They're made out of wood. So it takes a while. They gotta put a coat of finish on it and everything. So that wouldn't be surprised if we see that being a little dry in supply for a while, but just wanna give you a heads up about that. New pen that we have here, this is one that uh, I don't even think I've talked about before, but it is the a new stipula. This is a Ventidu, the Toco Ferro model, um, but it's not made of of any type of uh, metal. I mean, it has metal components to it, um, but it's actually a resin version that's clear and uh, it's called the Gold Touch. And it's, uh, <laughs> well, it doesn't really take a whole lot of explaining once you actually see it in person, if I can get this shine down. But, uh, you know, folks around the office here are affectionately calling it the Goldschlager pen because uh, it literally has, it's clear with gold flakes floating around in it. So um, I may or may not have to explain to you what Goldschlager is. It's a, uh, it's a drink that has gold flakes in it, an adult beverage, if you will. Um, but anyway, we have that one now. You can check it out on our site. It is a Goulet exclusive that we, helped to co-design. Basically, when we were there in Italy last year, we were talking about it and they kind of said like, yeah, we can we can put stuff in the resin, we can do all kinds of things. And I don't remember whether it was something we proposed or they proposed, but it was like gold flakes. And we we're like, no way, gold flakes? They're like, yeah, we can straight up do gold flakes in these things. And we we're like, what the heck? Let's try it. So here it is. All right, the uh, we have a new Namiki Emperor, the Shoki, very cool pen. Uh, I don't have it to show you here because you know, I'd have to get white gloves and the whole thing. <laughs> really nice pen, $9,600 pen. It's an emperor. It's just, you know, many, 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 many hours spent you or she lacquering these pens. So beautiful. You can check them out. Got a couple in-house. Uh, the Diplomat Arrow in orange black. I mentioned this. It is an orange body with a black cap. I was missed. I didn't even know last week, but that's what it is. So we have those and actually they've been received pretty well so far. Um, so we got more of those. Uh, the field notes, we have the National Park Series D, which is the Arches Grand Teton and Sequoia. So if you're into that whole theming, we now have the next series. Uh, and then we have a ton of stuff coming soon, ton. And I'm gonna mention some of it, but not all of it. And I can't show it all because we don't have it yet, but a lot of it's on our site. We're gonna be getting in some more Mark Bacchus medium CSI grinds on some Bronze Age Homo Sapiens. So that's pretty exciting if you have been waiting for more of those. Also, the Homo Sapiens Skylight, which is the new double reservoir power filler with the ink windows. Uh, you can check those out. So put out a video on that. I was very excited. We were able to get a sample ahead of time. So we were able to work on a video to kind of go with that. That's gonna be forthcoming. We'll have the video out. Not sure exactly when the pens are coming in, probably around Fountain Pen Day. So you're gonna see the video as a little bit of a teaser. And I don't have it to show you here today because I don't physically have it in my hands anymore because I had a sample and we had to send it back. But anyway, at least got that video out for you. So that's pretty fun. We're also doing some Mark Bacchus Medium CSI grinds on that pen too. Yes, doing some cool stuff these days. Very excited. We also have our next Montegrappa Elmo color. And I'm gonna try to pronounce this correctly. Yenzania sfrangiata. So it's a, a flower uh, that's in Italy, but it's a, it's a purple, it's like a violet color. Um, this is to continue on to the series of Goulet exclusive colors that we have done in the Elmo so far. So we originally had the red, green, blue, and now we're going to purple. This purple is a very vibrant color to show you how it looks in the series. And then just to show you up close with the individual color, it's pretty darn good. Da -da 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 beautiful pen. Um, you know, I know purple is just one of those colors that 
um, can really vary depending on how much pink is in it and how much brown or whatever. This one is a little leaning on the pink side, just a little bit. Um, super pearlescent, very, very high chatoyance on this one. Um, little bit of see-throughness on it, uh, but not too much. Not enough where you would be able to like see the ink level probably, um, but very attractive pen. And I learned at Monte Grappa when we were there uh, in Italy, part of the reason, and Drew has commented on this before, like why the nibs look so good and they look like gold nibs, even though they're steel nibs, they actually, so these are Yovo steel nibs. Most manufacturers, including our own polished steel nibs, they're literally just polished stainless steel. But Monte Grappa actually rhodium plates their polished stainless steel Yovo nibs. It doesn't really change the color, but it just adds a little bit of brilliance to it. It's a little bit shinier, which is why it looks so much like a gold nib, because when you have a yellow gold nib and you plate it in rhodium, it looks silver, it's gonna look exactly this kind of like sheen and brilliance and stuff. So um, Drew and I, just, we knew that like something was different about those nibs and we were able to confirm that with Giuseppe over in Monte Grappa. So it's, it's the little things, it's the little touches. Um, so that pen, it's gonna be a little bit more just because that pen is going up a little bit in price that's coming from Monte Grappa. But that's an exclusive that we have um, that we're gonna have for you know probably a season, maybe a, few, a couple of months, not exactly sure. It depends on how quickly they go, but it's like a one and done, one batch of them. And it was cool, we were actually able to get some pictures of them in the manufacturing process when we were there a few weeks ago. So that's pretty rad. That is forthcoming, but I was able to bring that one back from Italy, so I get to show you today. But it's on our site, you can sign up for that. Uh, we are going to have a new Namiki Yukari Royale, which is the next smaller version of, you know, the Emperor is like the biggest one, the flagship. Yukari Royale is a little bit smaller. I actually think the Yukari Royale is like the perfect size for my hands. I don't actually own one. And boy, am I tempted with this one because the theming is awesome. It's the Royal Lioness and Cubs. And I just, I really kind of resonates with me. Um, you know, the theming, it sounds a little, sounds a little harsh, but basically the Lioness um, uh, in, in lore, I don't know if this actually happens, but certainly in like the Japanese lore, the Lioness will basically drop her cubs down into a ravine of some kind and stay there at the top and the cubs have to like kind of climb their way out to get back to their mom. And it sounds really harsh, but the whole idea behind it is that the mother is always there, basically encouraging, motivating her kids, but knowing that the kids have to be able to overcome their own struggles. And that is the mother's role in helping to raise the kids. It's not to do everything for them, but it's to help to, you know, basically, you know, encourage her cubs to overcome her own challenges because in the real world, um, that's what they're gonna have to face. So I really vibe with that because, you know, I try to do the same for my kids, protect them, keep them safe, but not try to do everything for them, try to raise them up and teach them the ways of the world because in the grand scheme of things, we only have a few years to impact our kids and then the world is out to get them. So anyway, I'm, it's a, it's a very expensive pen, but I'm, I'm, I really vibe with that particular pen. Um, other things that are coming, the Diplomat Esteem Mad C. Very, very interesting pen. So this is a collaboration with Mad C, the street artist. Had the great fortune of actually interviewing Matthias, the CEO of Diplomat, about the collaboration, all that kind of stuff. We're still editing that footage, so it's not released as of the, the put out of this Q&A, but that will be forthcoming here probably in the next week or two, um, as well as the pens will be coming out and I think in the next couple of weeks. So very cool um, pen, and I'm actually got a question about the esteem in the Q&A today, so if you're curious about that, stick around. Um, Diplomat Excellence A+, that's the newest version of the Excellence, is coming out with a new guilloche uh, uh, pen that is uh, Waves, so it's really cool. It's like a black, it's actually a matte lacquer that has an engraving that shows the metal underneath. So it looks looks really cool. And it's got a nice feel to it too. It's got a little bit of a texture, but not too much. So very cool. So we'll have that on our site. We have the Diplomat Aero Flame. So the Aero is a very popular uh, pen, probably the most recognizable pen from Diplomat, this kind of like Zeppelin-esque style pen. Um, and this is a flamed version. And if you're familiar with the Traveler Flame, you know that Diplomat's Flame um, is really durable actually. 
we don't have any issues with like flaking or anything like that. It's because it's not actually a coating that they're putting on here. So normally their arrows are made of aluminum. This one is made of steel and they had to test all different kinds of metals to see, but they, they heat treat this and they're actually heating up the entire body of the pen. And so this is like a chemical compositional change to the metal that they make to get this color effect. And the one I actually have here is a prototype. What I'm going to hold the, the final version is going to be a little more brilliant than this one even, but it all depends, you know, what you like. So we're going to try and photograph it and reflect it accurately. But, you know, it's kind of the same vein of the, um, if you're familiar with the, the fire blue Kaweco lily put, it's going to look very much like that finish. You know, but it's a little bit different because you got the flutes on this and all that. So it's a little bit heavier pen because it's steel, but very cool effect. Interesting things coming out of Diplomat on some of their metal pens. Um, other things we have come in the Pelican M200 Gold Marble is going to be coming out in the future. I've only seen pictures, but it's always cool to see new stuff coming from Pelican. I have this in the building just for a few moments. Um, because we had to like turn it around, get pictures, and then get it right back out. But it happened to overlap when I was shooting Q&A. So this is a new Visconti Torpedo, which is a very cool pen. Uh, the material is actually a unidirectional carbon fiber, which is not commonly used in pens. Very cool. So it's not a carbon fiber weave, but it almost looks like a brushed metal, but it's actually carbon fiber. And this one is like a midnight blue carbon fiber. It looks completely rad. Uh, it comes in two different trims of rose gold, which is what I have here, and a ruthenium. It's a double reservoir power filler. It's got an ink window in here, 18 karat gold nib, the full size Visconti nib, nice threads on here. Double reservoir filler is great. Super cool pen, not a cheap pen. Limited edition, it's about $1,800. So not for everybody, but very cool and glad that I could show you while I had it in the building. Uh, other things that we have, let's see here. The Pelican is coming out with another Machier. This is the Japanese umbrella themed. Got that up on the site, just a hair under four grand. Again, expensive, but man, if you're into Machier Yurushi stuff, Pelican is great. Obviously, Namiki is like the best. So really good stuff. I'm very excited to see some more, you know, Machier stuff coming, coming out, of the, out of the pike here. Um, we have a couple new, uh, sorry, we have one new Visconti Van Gogh wheat field with crows. Uh, and we have a Conklin Duragraph uh, matte black with rose gold. So the original was a shiny black with rose gold. This is a matte version. Uh, and we actually, we did really well with the original shiny one. And of course we love matte black. We love rose gold here. So this is one that is going to be a Goulet exclusive. Um, and so we just, we just wanted them all. Very cool. It's matte on the grip, matte on the body. You get a little bit of shine here on the finials, uh, but everything else is matte, black, OmniFlex nib. Super slick looking, it's around $60. So if you're into that, and these are the, you know, if you followed the OmniFlex, these will be the, the newer, um, new, newest versions, new, newest iterated version of the, the Conklin OmniFlex. I'd be careful not to speak about it too much like it's anything different, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be the latest and greatest OmniFlex nibs that they have. Uh, and then we have even more, uh, some new Montegrappa Elmo colors. Um, these will not be Goulet exclusives. Um, they might be US exclusives, I'm not sure. Can't remember honestly, but um, they're beautiful colors. I got to see them in person in Italy. I don't have them here, but we have pictures. Um, an iris yellow, black star calla lily, and blue cross gentian. And the blue cross gentian is the stunner, in my opinion. Great pens, really excited to see so much good stuff coming. So if you are, you know, thinking, well, I wonder if uh, anything new is gonna be coming out in the pen world. Officially, the gauntlet has opened because I think now through basically the holiday season, you're gonna see so much stuff coming out. It's gonna be great. Very exciting stuff, glad to be a part of it. Now let's get to some questions, shall we? All right, let's start out with some pen and writing questions, shall we? First is from Mackenzie H on Facebook. The Diplomat Esteem and the Lamy Studio seem like similar pens. I love the studio and I'm wondering if you could compare and contrast them side by side. Uh, happy to do that. Um, so they actually are fairly similar in style uh, as, as I'm looking at them here. And it just so happens that I have um, two different olives. <laughs> so they even had some that are the same name. 
Lamia Studio is just a little bit longer. I think the studio is a little more distinctive for us. We've been carrying it for years, and uh, it's it's a you know Lamia is a brand, definitely more known in the U.S. Um, in particular. Not sure about worldwide. I am pretty sure they're bigger than Diplomat. So um, you know that's those two pens next to each other. The Lamia has this propeller clip here that is pretty distinctive. Um, it's known they've done a whole bunch of different color versions. Um, this particular olive. Diplomat that we have here was actually a one, an old one from maybe 10 years ago that they don't make anymore. Uh, and I don't even think that we have it anymore, but I kept one because I keep almost everything. And um, <laughs> some of the things that are distinctive about the studio, the propeller clip, obviously. Lamy has proprietary cartridges and converters for their pens. So this one's gonna have the Z27. Uh, the one that's got, you know, without the pegs. Uh, but you have to get Lamy's converter. Uh, it has a shiny metal grip section. There's one, at least one that doesn't. I know the Lux, plate, the Lux black one doesn't, but also the stainless steel version of the Studio has kind of this rubbery grip. Uh, and so those ones don't, but everything else has kind of this tapered shiny metal grip, which some people, that's probably like the one thing that people like the least about this pen in general, because some people love metal grips because it feels kind of cool and it warms up to the touch as you're using it and uh, they just like the way it feels. Other people, it's like, it's too slick. I have very oily fingers. So when I'm writing for a long time with a slick metal grip, I find I have to grip it a little bit harder. It kind of fatigues my hand a little bit more. So it's fine when I'm just carrying it around uh, and writing quick notes, but it's not as comfortable as a long writer for me, but that's just me. Not everybody feels that way. Um, the studio has a couple different versions of the nibs, but they are all Lamy proprietary nibs. Um, so they have steel nib versions and then they have gold nib versions on some of the colors that come out every now and then. Um, so depending on which you're getting, obviously the price, it's basically doubled if you get a gold nib. Um, so it's a little higher. Uh, and uh, the nibs are swappable between Lamy pens, which is one of the huge pluses of it. Um, precision machined, it's like really, really good. The colors are really good. Um, some of the colors are more of a matte, have a little bit of a texture to them. Some of them are shiny. It really just depends on which, excuse me, which one you're going for. Snap cap, snap to post. Uh, very similar kind of design on the uh, Diplomat Esteem. It's a little bit less expensive. Um, and it, it feels just a little bit less expensive. It doesn't feel cheap by any means, but I don't know if it's the, it's got a resin grip, which does grip a little bit better, but I gotta be honest, the resin grip doesn't maybe feel as, as hefty as the as the studio. It's really weird, I can't explain it very well, but um, you know, because it's got the metal and the, and the, um, the, the resin grip here, it gets a better grip, but it back weights it just a little bit more. It's a very subtle difference, but in terms of the way it writes, if you like more of a back-weighted pen, it's not severe. It's not like if you have a really long, heavy pen. You know, this pen is, they're about the same weight. So either one you post, it's gonna back-weight it a little bit. But um, without it posted, the Esteem is back-weighted just a tiny bit. Um, these ones have um, Yovo nibs on them. Very respected nibs. I really like the way they write. I don't find them vastly different than the Lamy nibs, to be quite honest with you. They're pretty similar, all made in Germany here. Um, and the quality is really good on both of them. So even the way they write is not gonna be all that different. It's gonna be very subtle. One of the nice things about the Diplomat is that they do use standard international cartridges and converters. Um, that's this little placeholder cartridge there. So got a little standard short guy in here, and then you can use a standard international converter, which I don't currently have installed on this pen, but you probably know what they look like. So a little more universal there. Also, this is a number five Yovo nib, so theoretically, if you wanted to, you could swap it with another you know, number five Yovo nib. It's not like a standard housing thing you can swap out, but you could yank it and, and make it happen if you really wanted to. Um, so that's that's a thing. Um, the clip on this one is uh, a tension clip, just like just like the um, the Studio. So that feels about the same uh, in terms of the clip functionality. I really don't use my clips often at all, personally, because I don't like. I don't often wear shirt pockets in them, only in the wintertime when I'm wearing flannel, pretty much. So I really don't use my clips other than roll stops. Um, but anyway, functionality of it may be just a tiny, tiny little bit better on the Diplomat, because it's got a little more surface area on there to grab onto. The Part of the thing about this propeller clip on the Studio is it's only got this tiny little thin part to be able to grab onto your shirt. It still grabs just fine, but 
Yeah, let me give it a test. I actually haven't, haven't like thoroughly tested this. This is on flannel. It's pretty thick material. I like never wear dress shirts if I have any choice about it. Just not my style, as you've seen from 271 Q&As. How many times have I ever worn a dress shirt? Just don't like to do it. Part of it's because I sweat a lot. And I'm a weird size. My arms are very long. Okay, so both are pretty good. Actually, they, they, they both grab on a little bit. The, the, the studio is moving up and down just a tad. Just a tad. So, yeah. Hypothesis confirmed. You get a little firmer grip on the Diplomat, but still. Both very workable clips. Um, they both post fine. They both snap to post on the back. So, and they can rotate a little bit with the snapping. So they're not gonna be, they're not actually grabbing onto the material of the body of the pen, um, but they are actually snapping onto the back. So they're both very similar in that way. Um, yeah, there you go. Price is a little bit less on this. You're looking $64 street price, $80 MSRP versus $80 street price, $100 MSRP on the studio. So it's really up to you which one you like more but they both write well. They're both decent pens, both from very reputable, high quality German brands. Just comes down to those little details of which you like more. Um, I have the, uh, those were the olive ones. I have the, you know, like the Studio Aquamarine here. And I actually have a blue, this is a blue granite, just to show you some, what some of the textures can look like a little bit. Um, so this is a matte version. And then this, uh, this is a texture that uh, we have as kind of the special buy. We had with the olive, we had the black one, and then we had the blue granite. And uh, so we might have a few more of these for a little bit, uh, but not forever. And the clip on this one's a little different, actually, because you can tell these are these are older versions. Um, so the clip, even on these two diplomats, are different. Um, but what you see here, these are the these are the newer ones that are coming on. So this must be a little bit older pen. There you go. <laughs> so I guess I should theoretically test the old clip, but it doesn't matter. You don't really care as much about the clip, or maybe you do. But I'm moving on. All right, pasteboard love on Instagram. Do most pens have a break-in period out of the box, or should they write perfectly immediately? Okay, very fair question. I totally get where you're coming from. Perfect is a word that I don't like to use around fountain pens because they're very subjective, and what's perfect to some people is not perfect to other people. There's no one standard for what a perfect writing fountain pen is, but I get what you're saying in general, should it perform well out of the box or is it going to perform perhaps differently, have a little bit of a break-in period, just like when you buy a new car, it might be a little stiff. As you drive it for a few thousand miles, it's gonna break in a little bit, you know, because the machining and stuff's gotta kinda, kinda break in. Um, mostly it should perform pretty well out of the box. Um, you might have a little bit of a break-in period. I think most of that break-in period um, is going to be with the flow of the pen, particularly if you have an ebonite feed, um, but it can happen with other feeds too. There might be uh, a little bit of machining oil, there might be you know, um, just small bits of debris or something like that left over from the manufacturing process. So it's never a bad idea to clean your pen before you use it. It's not always required. It's not like if you don't, your pen's not gonna work. But whenever I have a pen yeah, I usually don't have the patience to clean a pen because I'm at my desk and I'm like, oh, I don't wanna walk all the way over and clean the pen, so I'm just too excited, let me ink it up. But if I ever have any type of a trouble or missed expectation with a pen, I'll immediately clean it because I'm like, all right, it's a new pen, let me clean it out, try it again. Honestly, like 80% of the time, if there is any issue with it, just cleaning it right away makes the difference. So it's always a good practice to keep in mind. Um, so that's something to, to consider, um, but, um, I think uh, everything should fit well, it should look good. You know, there may be certain things like if you're, if certain parts are a little stiff or if you have something like a snap cap, the snap might be a little tighter. That may break in a little bit over time as it gets used. Um, you know, the threads, if you have certain threads that feel a little rough, just a, just a little bit, it's not like it's gonna be like scratching and then it's ultimately gonna feel buttery smooth. It should more or less feel like it does, but there may be a little bit that, that kind of smooths out, evens out a little bit. So you'll get some of that, but basically the way that it writes should more or less be the way that it is. Because if you think about it, these nibs, you know, they're very durable. They're made to last a very, very long time. So they're not gonna change drastically in any kind of a super short period. Um, I think honestly what happens most of the time, I've talked about this before, but I think most of the time it's, I've, I've talked about this before in terms of you should you lend your pen to someone else because it's, you know, conforms to the way you write and yada, yada, yada. 
uh, sort of. But honestly, I think it's more that the writer conforms to the way that the pen writes. Because <laughs> you're way more adaptable in your thinking and you're softer and you're, you know, you're more malleable in terms of your psyche and your hand and stuff like that uh, than the pen or the nib is. Um, certainly someone could ruin a pen by, you know, mashing the nib. Um, but in terms of the subtleties of how much is it going to break in, all that kind of stuff, it's not going to be a drastic difference. Um, if a pen's not working super, super great and, and it's just not quite where you want it to be, it could be that over a couple of weeks, it kind of it kind of eases in a little bit. The flow starts to be better. Maybe it smooths out a little bit because you are, when you're writing on paper, you are essentially, um, you know, micro polishing that nib because the paper has the slightest amount of, of feedback to it, um, which in, in essence polishes the nib. Um, but it's, it's not going to be drastic. It's not like you're going to have this really toothy pen and have to use it for a month or two. It's suddenly going to be buttery smooth. That's where it would require maybe some smoothing out and stuff like that. But again, every manufacturer does it differently. So it's not like there's one standard for how smooth the pen should write or how wet the flow should be. Every manufacturer has their own standard. So it may be that you get it and you're like, this pen's not writing well, it's da 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 da, but that's actually how they intend it to write. It's just, you may be a slightly different preference. So that's where it's good to really do your research, to know, you talk to our team, read reviews, all these types of things can really be helpful to get your proper expectations. And then uh, consider breaking yourself into the pen as much as anything. Um, the um, ink, you know, could take a little, I talked about the ink taking a little while to get flowing. Yep, I just talked about that out of order. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so all this to say, I think largely the pens should write pretty well out of the box. Um, you shouldn't expect anything too drastic, but certainly there would be a little bit of uh, accommodating that both you and the pen can make to be a good match to each other. It's really gonna be kind of a judgment call. All right, troubleshooting question. This is from Andrea P on Facebook. Why does ink get inside the clear or not clear grip section above the nib? It's annoying. <laughs> okay, Andrea, uh, lots of people feel this way. So not shocked to be getting this question from you, but I thought I would um, give it a casual mention here. So, um, Ink is mostly water, right? Um, and it's going to take the path of least resistance. It's going to fill any void that is in its way. Um, and capillary action is your friend here. This is what's getting the ink from the ink chamber or the reservoir down through the grip and out your nib. So what's happening actually is the ink is just working its way and it's just filling in whatever voids are there. Um, and it visually can have an effect sort of like I have on this Noodler's Ahab. I'm gonna try and demonstrate this uh, in a way that I think is representative of what you're feeling after I get some ink on my hands. So here you go, get a little ink around the nib, maybe in the grip, um, and it can look kind of splotchy if you're very uh, discerning in terms of how, how streamlined and clean you like the ink to look inside your demonstrator pen. That could be something frustrating to you, and I do empathize with that. It is not necessarily as much of my own personal, um, you know, discernment uh, because I've just seen so many different pens that have been so many different things. Uh, if you have a pen like this Ahab, for example, or like this, uh, I've got a Twisby Go that's inked up. This Twisby Go has a shimmering ink in it. So here you can even see some of the shimmeringness, sh shimmerality that's happening inside this grip. And it can look a little splotchy. Some parts are going to be shinier than others. It's going to look a little inconsistent. To me, it's like, it's part of the beauty of it all. Now I got shimmering ink all over my hand. Part of that, to me, is the beauty of it. I think it's, it's wonderful that ink flows and splotches. I mean, our, our logo is an ink splatter, for crying out loud. So uh, it's not something that I think is necessarily to be uh, avoided, though you have your own preferences, and I, I do understand that. Um, I would maybe steer away from those particular pens, the ones that have clear grips in general, because just about every pen with a clear grip that I've ever seen has the potential for that to happen. Um, the only pens that you probably won't have any type of an issue with that is a pen that has an internal nib housing. Um, thinking about the Noodler's Triple Tail, which is a relatively newer pen. Um, this one has a housing uh, that 
the ink flows down through the back of the feed, which is enclosed in its own internal housing inside the grip. So even though it's a clear grip, you're not seeing the ink as it's flowing down through the pen. However, if you look at my triple tail, when I filled the pen, I dipped the whole thing in a bottle of ink and now I have splotchiness happening inside my grip because of the way that I filled it. Literally every pen I'm holding up, I'm getting ink on my hand, I love it. So, even a pen with a housing, it's no guarantee that you're not gonna get ink on there. I think of my beloved Pilot Custom 74, which I don't have inked at the moment, otherwise I would show you the ink that gets in that grip basically doesn't come out because it's like a two-layered grip in there that's glued in place. The ink seeps up in there when you fill the pen and it just doesn't ever come out. So that is actually a little annoying. It's the one thing I don't really love about that pen. Um, but to give you a little glimmer of hope, I have here a Stipula Carbon Florentia, which is an exclusive pen that we have here. Did not necessarily know when we designed this pen, but um, it does give a little bit of an example of a pen that can maybe be a glimmer of hope for you. So this has a translucent grip section with an internal housing on it that actually does not have any splotchiness. It is inked up like so. I'll go ahead and get some ink on my hand on uh, this one too. So it is inked up, uh, but it does not have any splotchiness. So there are pens out there that can do that, but oh my gosh, it's not something that we can really like test for easily. It's not anything that can be an absolute guarantee because you might get ink in that grip. It's something you got to kind of read reviews and just learn over time. If it's something that like everybody's, you know, screaming about, then we can add it into our process of something that we test for. Um, but gosh, it is, it is just like one more thing that is, that is, uh, takes a huge amount of time uh, for us to test for. So we just don't do it uh, unless like by individual request. Part of the reason why, and I'm taking this part of pen so I can show you, it has this tiny little O-ring. Can you see that? Tiny little O-ring uh, that actually fits uh, at the top of the housing. So some pens will do this. This is a nice little thoughtful touch. So this pen has it. Um, I'm thinking a lot of the Twisby pens have it, like the 580. Those have, um, you know, maybe some clear, some of the versions have clear grips and they might have an O-ring, you know, at the back and maybe at the top so that ink doesn't get into the grip, even as you're filling the pen. Uh, so that is definitely a, a thoughtful consideration to be made. That's probably why this housing uh, right here, uh, this grip does not have any ink in it is because of that O-ring. It might be the kind of thing, if you have a removable nib in it, if there's no O-ring there, you might be able to put an O-ring there. You're gonna get kind of specific and we don't carry like a full array of O-rings. The housing is a stuff for different sizes on different pens. So it's not something that we like stock universally because that would really be difficult to, to do. Um, you know, but hey, if everybody's banging down our doors, we could always consider it. Um, but uh, a little bit of silicone grease, perhaps, could maybe do the trick, save you if you are very particular about that. Wouldn't do any good for you on something like the Ahab or the Twisby Go because that you don't want to put you don't want to put um, silicone grease here where there is no housing because the grease is going to get in the feed and it could block the flow of ink coming down through your pen. That's not good. You don't want that. Even if it aesthetically looks better, you don't want the ink to be flowing, to stop flowing through your pen. So, you know, um, it's, it's something that for me over time, it's become kind of like nib creep or getting ink on your fingers a little bit. Um, I actually get my hands messier when I clean my pens than I do when I fill them, generally speaking. But it's something I just come to accept and uh, it might be easier for you to do so or you just, if it really, really bothers you, don't get pens with clear grips and then you know that. Not all pens have clear grips, most don't. So it's not necessarily always an issue. Um, but you can learn that about yourself. Maybe now just understand a little bit more why that happens. And uh, it might still annoy you, but you're at least, you know, the more you know. Do, 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 do. Right? All right, business questions. Got two of them, one's from Stephanie P on Facebook. Any big plans for Fountain Pen Day? So I alluded to this earlier in the video. Yes, we have some plans for Fountain Pen Day, of course. We love fountain pens. Fountain Pen Day, it's, it's an unofficial holiday. I talked about this a bit, but I'm gonna recap just a tad. We are definitely gonna have some deals uh, for sure. I don't wanna get too much into specifics as to what they're gonna be, 
partly because it's a lot to cover and it's going to be hard for you to remember it all and we're going to, honestly going to provide a way more helpful summary we're going to have a landing page on the website day of we're going to have an email newsletter that's going to feature it all so even me talking about it the specifics of it is not going to be as exciting as it will be in a much more helpful format so i'm partly encouraging you to go sign up for our email newsletter if you haven't already and check back on the site friday of next week november 1st 2019 to learn all the details of Fountain Pen Day. We are definitely doing some things though, things that we don't normally do, that much I will say. And we're gonna have lots of deals. We've acquired some pens specifically for this day to do some pretty blowout deals and really make some things exciting for you all. Now I wanna recap a little bit of just what is Fountain Pen Day, why does it matter, why is it special? So um, it's a, uh, it's a uh, unofficial, community organized holiday, basically just celebrating the use of fountain pens. Um, there is a there is a website, or at least there was, and then it was down, and I don't know if it's come back, whatever. But um, they said it's a day to embrace, promote, and share about fountain pens, which totally makes sense. Um, so it started back in 2012. It originally originated uh, on Fountain Pen Network. Just some enthusiasts that were talking on there. Hey, why isn't there a fountain pen holiday? Let's create one. What day should it be? I don't know. What should it encompass? Who knows? And just lots of ideas thrown out there. Carrie Yeager really took it and ran with it um, and has been known as the guy behind Fountain Pen Day. Came up with the logo, was really going to a lot of pen shows, handing out swag with the logo, pretty much without his like grassroots organization. The initial idea that culminated in the community would have died out. He really carried that torch for several years. And then other retailers and people like us started to pick it up and now we're kind of running with it, right? But for me personally, um, I was always a little bit torn because we've been a retailer ever since Fountain Pen Day was conceived. I, I like the spirit of Fountain Pen Day and promoting the use and all that kind of stuff, but I didn't, as odd as it sounds, as much as it may personally benefit me to commercialize such a holiday, I was actually kind of resistant to it. I was like, I don't want Fountain Pen Day to be just about, you know, discounts and and sales and deals and stuff like that and have it essentially kind of ruin the spirit of the holiday. Not that it was this long established thing anyway, but even still, I didn't want that to be all that it was. Um, but honestly, I've come around in the last couple of years about that. I felt a little conflicted at the beginning, but the thing is for us as a retailer, we are hardcore promoting the use and love and passion of fountain pens all year long with our content and our service and all these other things. So for us to have, you know, it's kind of one day saying that, like we, we in the past created content and did things and it was just kind of like just one more piece of content, just saying a different thing about Fountain Pen Day. What we actually found is the best way that we as retailers could utilize our own resources to get as many people as excited about Fountain Pens as possible was to you know, still talk about it like I am in this video, but to get people excited, and part of you do that as a retailer is to do special deals, promos, maybe special products and things like that. Um, may or may not have a sticker. So these types of things um, are ways that we can serve as a retailer to get people excited. Now, if we're the only ones doing that, then it's gonna feel fairly commercial, right? And if all the retailers are doing it and it's just all about sales and deals and we're trying to sell stuff, it's gonna feel a little hollow. So really what the, the spirit of it is to get everybody excited and talking about fountain pens, sharing the love. So we wanna encourage you, I've seen some other retailers and stuff doing like contests and giveaways and promotions and things like that, that's cool. Like I really am happy to see other people doing things around Fountain Pen Day because it's really like our community's holiday. So I encourage all of you to maybe start talking about it. There's a whatever Fountain Pen Day, I forget that the hashtag that's used I think it's Fountain Pen Day 2019 or FPD 2019. Just check around for different hashtags that you see people using and try using some yourself on your various social platforms. Um, and, you know, just maybe post something about fountain pens if you don't normally and just talk about, hey, Fountain Pen Day is coming. Just want to let you know why they're important to me. And just, you know, maybe post something if you don't normally. And if thousands of people are doing that, that brings the awareness of this beautiful hobby uh, much greater than I could by running a certain sale or a deal. So it's it's all of us are playing a part in 
this, uh, this, this celebration of this holiday. We're going to be doing some content related things, but we're also going to be doing sales and deals. And, um, you know, I think that's, uh, that's a great way to, to celebrate the, the kind of everybody wins. Um, so spread that love online, do some posting, sharing, tagging, just the more you talk about it, the better it's going to be sharing that it's a thing in general. I'm just talking about pens, it's going to get people excited. All right. The other question I have, this is related to business stuff from Alan S. on Facebook. Besides the obvious busy times of the years like the holidays, what's the busiest stationary buying season that maybe we wouldn't expect? Okay, so I had to think about this one. I will be honest with you, I have a pretty boring answer. I'm not the whole industry. Uh, Gooley Pens is not the whole industry. I'm going to share based on our experience, which I know is not the typical maybe and it's not the totality of what you can expect especially in like the stationary world because in the grand scheme of things we we do a lot with pens and ink and paper is honestly kind of the the tag along even though we started out with paper and ink and all that paper now is dwarfed by by pens and ink uh, interest part of that's because just the nature of the product it's just how excited do people get about paper um and it's uh you know paper has to be produced in such a way that you can't you can't do it in small batches and, and limited runs like you can with um, with pens. But that said, um, kind of in the stationary buying world in general, uh, for us, it's really not anything that you wouldn't expect. Probably the holidays are definitely a bump, maybe a little bit of a bump in back to school, as you would expect. People are buying school supplies. If they're into fountain pens, they're buying fountain pen school supplies. Beyond that, there's really not much of a bump. Other than when we have new product releases or particular sale or promotion or something like Fountain Pen Day, um, you know, just in general, when there's more interest, more people just have you know fountain pen related things on the mind, we might see a bump. But there's no, for us, there's no like, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe it, but President's Day, everybody goes nuts for stationery at President's Day. Not really. Like we actually have a surprisingly unseasonal business here, which I'm very grateful for because it makes actually running a company way simpler. Um, you know, but I know other companies, you know, for example, where certain holidays are a huge part of their business. And actually that's the way, especially if uh, uh, other companies I've talked to where roller balls are a bigger part, pencils, ballpoints, these types of things, major gift giving holidays like graduation time, Mother's Day, Father's Day is usually a pretty big one for pens. Um, you know, back to school. These are usually much bigger deal. Um, us, eh, it's really honestly, it's not that big of a deal. That's why we don't promote most holidays super heavily because we've tried them before and it's been <laughs> crickets, you know? So that's fine. We don't need to artificially try to create demand around a holiday because honestly, something like Father's Day or President's Day or whatever, you're going to get a zillion emails from Target and Home Depot and Macy's and everybody else anyway. You don't need more from us if it's going to feel forced. So we'll lean into the things that you all naturally get excited about on certain holidays, which for us is mainly the holidays, a little bit of back to school, and not too much else. So there you go. That's all I got for you on that one. Last question. This is a personal question, not even so related about pens. So if you're like Brian, I only want questions where you talk about pens, go ahead and shut it off. I'll talk a little bit about pens. But anyway, this is a personal question from R. Tyler James on Instagram. Brian's EDC, like everything he carries daily. And everything in carries was capitalized there. That's why I heavily emphasize those. Um, so I'm torn with this question because honestly, pretty much everywhere I go, especially when I'm coming to and from work, or if I'm going to be traveling somewhere for more than a few hours, and I think I might be actually doing some work, I bring my entire backpack uh, with my laptop and all of the accoutrement, you know, including my pen case, which may have a dozen or more pens. I may have multiple pen cases. I could be carrying 20 or 30 pens at a time, depending on what I'm doing, where I'm going. Am I bringing pens home? Am I going to clean out a dozen pens tonight? These types of things. I don't think that's necessarily in the spirit of your question based on how much you emphasize carries daily. When I think of daily carry, I think of things on my person, right? So that's what I'm gonna limit it to, just for the sake of this, with a caveat that I have a whole backpack filled with all kinds of other random things. Um, but I'll talk about my, my EDC, right? Um, now the thing I will say, if you go on my personal Instagram, you will see zero EDC pictures because I'm not like an EDC guy. 
uh, which I know is weird. I'm a 35 year old male, active on Instagram. I get targeted for EDC stuff constantly. I follow some other people who are into EDC stuff. I see all kinds of, believe me, knives and flashlights and, you know, various, you know, titanium wallets and these types of things. Um, I appreciate them, but I, I'm so deep in fountain pens. I have two kids running the business, all that. I frankly just don't have much margin in my life to get super into, you know, details of the things that I carry every day. Super respect people that do. I think it's awesome. I greatly appreciate it, kind of at arm's distance, but I'm also just, I got a lot of other things going on. So I will show you my things. It may be slightly underwhelming, but I'll at least show you what I've got going on in my life. Okay, things that I have going on. I wear your typical types of clothes. I have a nondescript leather belt that is whatever was at Target that seemed to be a reasonable price at the time that I may have lost or gained weight. Um, other things that I have, I wear my wedding ring, um, which is not a particularly special ring. It's actually not the original ring I wore because the original ring I wore was super cheap because Rachel and I had no money and it was such a poor quality gold that it actually like split because it was so thin and such a terrible alloy um, <laughs> that my original wedding ring broke and it was not worth repairing. Um, so I, a few years back, got a new wedding ring and it's made, I don't even remember what it's made of, but it's not gold some other kind of, it's not stainless steel, something else, tungsten, something or other, I don't know. But at the time I thought I may have had a gold allergy um, or a nickel allergy maybe, so I got some kind of hyperallergenic whatever ring. So that's fine, it's whatever, it's not that not big of a deal. I do have an Apple Watch, which I'm torn about. I've had it for about a year. I like it, but I also like other watches, but I just, I just don't wear them as much. Um, partly because, you know, I like that it tracks my activity and all that type of stuff. I'm not like super dyed in the wool, like everybody should have an Apple Watch, whatever. But I kind of got the bug last year. I got it, I'm wearing it ever since. I did try getting a different band for it and I hated it. So I returned it and I was like, this band is fine. So it's practical, it works. Um, it suits my lifestyle, more or less. Other things that I care, I really don't wear any other jewelry so to speak, on any kind of regular basis. I do have a class ring that I don't wear very much because it's a 36 penny weight ring and it's huge. And I've also gained a little bit of weight and so it doesn't quite fit so much and I need to get it adjusted so I don't wear it all that often. I have a rather nondescript brown leather wallet. I'm not gonna show you anything on the inside because it has my personal information, but you know, it's a bifold wallet, whatever. I got it at Target. I really don't care about it. It holds the stuff that I need to on my butt, right? That's really all I care about there. Other things that I have going on, I keep my phone on me. Uh, I normally have a case on my phone, but I have not yet gotten one. I got a new phone, the 11 Pro. I do like the phone. It takes great pictures, which is pretty much the reason why I got it, because taking good pictures is a huge part of my life between my children and because I pens. Um, the pen thing that I do keep on me basically at all times, I have a single leather slip that I use from Aston Leather that is well aged. I've been carrying this probably eight years. And I have my daily carry of the moment and has been of the moment for four years is my Homo Sapiens Bronze Age that I enjoy rather much, inked up with Robert Oster Blue Water Ice. That has come to be just in my old standby and uh, it works. It nib creeps a little bit in the top. It's very possible it could get ousted by the new Homo sapiens skylight. We'll see about that. But anyway, I may rotate this pen in and out depending on if there's other things that I'm using. Sometimes I'll carry multiples. I might have another slip that has multiples on me, um, but I usually always have at least one pen. Other things that I have in my other pocket. So the one like, ooh, EDC thing that I have. So I do carry a pocket knife on me at all times. And it's a, it's a fairly legitimate pocket knife. It's a Benchmade 530, in case that matters to you. Fairly respectable, so um, I've been carrying a pocket knife for years and years and years because I open packages, I have kids that need toys cut open, these types of things. I just like to have it, it's handy. This one's um, got like a, uh, I don't know what it is, uh, grip that's fairly light. Pen is well, no, sorry, the pen. Just like defaulted into pen mode. It's pretty well balanced, not too big clips on, you can see like all the black is worn off because I've been carrying it so many years. Um, I've had that for probably five years. I think it was a Christmas gift from my father-in-law uh, and I've been using it pretty steadily. Knives is one of those things that I like 
sort of like watches. I got a little bit into watches and then I've eased back. Knives is one of those things I'm like, man, if I start getting into knives, it's just gonna be over. Like I'm gonna have to go really into it because I feel like I could. So I've really kept an arm's distance with knives. I like this one, it was starting to get kind of dull and I was like, you know, maybe I, maybe I should get a new knife. And I was like, wait a minute, I have like an entire workshop full of tools. I have Arkansas stones and all kinds of other things. Let me just sharpen it myself. I sharpened it up and I was like, this thing is like better than new. So, nope, kept the same knife. So I'm not getting deep into knives. If you happen to be a knife person, sorry. It's just not, not going there. Um, other things that I have in my pockets, let me just pull out what I've got. I'll just pull it, I'll pull it all out because I do carry a lot in my pockets. So something I almost always have on me, some sort of lip balm, chapstick brand, no affiliation, tends to be my go-to. Um, I've tried like Burt's Bees and other things, but you know, just good old chapstick, it tends to work. Um, I really chap lips all the time uh, and I talk a lot. So I usually carry chapstick, summer, winter, whatever. Sometimes I won't carry it, but often I do. Various car keys and other things that are not exciting at all. I do not have any super special key holder type thing. I think I have a couple different ones. This is like a detachable one that I honestly never detach anymore. I don't even know why I have this on here, frankly. And then I have another one that's got like a little grappling hook type thing. It's not actually a grappling hook. It actually used to be blue, but literally all the paint has worn off except for this tiny, tiny little bit here that you can see. That's what color the whole thing used to be, but I've had that for probably 10 years. And it's not broken yet, so I have not felt the need to replace it. There's all kinds of cool key ring things out there, and uh, for sure, I'd probably be interested in them, but uh, I just haven't bothered. Um, I do keep uh, Apple AirPods, because I have an iPhone, and the AirPods, I resisted for at least the first year that they came out. And then I saw some other people using them, and I was like, how do you like them? They were like, they're the greatest thing ever. And then I got them and I'm like, dang, these things are pretty awesome. So I use them a lot. I talk on the phone a lot. I listen to music, these types of things. So super handy, love them. And then one other kind of weird thing that I will sometimes not always carry on me. Those of you who have been following me on Instagram know that I may have a slight puzzle obsession. Um, so I actually bought a small Rubik's Cube that I will sometimes keep in my pockets just to use if I'm, you know, in line at Chipotle when I'm going to get dinner for my family before I go home. Uh, if I've got five or 10 minutes, of course I can pull out my phone, all that kind of stuff. So I don't do it all the time, but I usually keep this like in the cup holder in my car. And every now and then, if I'm feeling very tactile, I'll just pull it out and mess around with it a little bit. It's good to keep it sharp. So I remember those algorithms. But anyway, one, one kind of nerd thing I have. And that's it. I think that's all the interesting stuff that I have on me. It's not a great amount, but that's me. That's my life. Some of the other interesting things I keep in my backpack, but whatever. That's what I keep on my person. The one thing I will leave, I was talking with Drew literally right before I was going to record this. And I was like, yeah. He was like, do you have any interesting Q&A questions this week? I was like, eh, you know, fairly, fairly standard fare. I do have this uh, the other thing and a fountain pen day and all this kind of stuff and my EDC stuff. And he was like, are you going to promote cargo shorts? <laughs> because I'm known. Uh, in the summertime, that's pretty much exclusively what I wear. I'm a huge fan of practicality, very much a function over form person when it comes to my clothing. Um, so in the summertime, I find it to be easier. I always pretty much wear cargo shorts that have like a cell phone pocket. It's literally like an extra pocket behind the cargo short, uh, the cargo pocket on my right side that the phone just slips in and out of because I'm using my phone so often throughout the day. It's super handy to have that and I like that. So I pretty much exclusively look for that. It's very hard to find in pants, especially jeans. So I always mourn a little bit when fall rolls around. I'm like, I kind of like wearing jeans. It's very seasonal weather here in Virginia. So we get nice solid spring, summer and fall, very so average winter. So very, very mild seasons that have about the same duration for each season. Um, so I get good, you know, five, six months of shorts weather, five, six months of um, pants weather. That only adds up to 10 months if you go on the low end of either of those. Whatever, you get it, depending on, there's periods where you can wear shorts or pants. Um, but the thing is, they don't really make cargo jeans. I love cargo shorts because I carry stuff. Like I, I can't carry my sunglasses on. Okay, I have sunglasses too. I guess that's sort of a daily carry thing. Um, I do wear sunglasses, they're nothing special. They're like Dockers brand. I got it, Kohl's or something like that. Um, I hate, 
hate shopping for sunglasses. So I usually find one pair that I like and is fairly cheap and I'll buy like seven of them so that I can just wear them forever and lose them and break them and just replace them with another one and I keep one pair in each car and I have usually a couple other pairs that are floating around because I just, whatever, I hate managing sunglasses. But they're super necessary because if you noticed, I have these beautiful gray eyes. My eyes actually change color um, slightly based on what it is that I'm wearing. Um, gray eyes are not super common. Actually, only about 3% of the population has gray eyes. Um, often they look green, maybe a little tint of blue, but they do, they do shift color. Bad thing about having gray eyes, or really any light colored eyes, is that they essentially act like mirrors in the sun, and it makes my eyes go like this whenever there's like any degree of sunlight out there. So I pretty much have to wear sunglasses uh, everywhere I go when I'm outside. Otherwise, I just cannot see, and it's terrible, and it hurts my eyes. So always have to keep them in the car, always have to wear them. And it's funny, because Rachel has like dark brown eyes. She's not that way at all. So I really think it might have to do with the eye color. I don't know, maybe there's some other factor going on. I'm not an eye doctor. Optometrist. Ophthalmologist. Either way, I know nothing about eyes other than I have them in my head and they help me see. Um, but, there you go. So, cargo pants, great for carrying around sunglasses. Otherwise, I just do like I'm doing today and I leave them on my desk. Probably three out of the five days of the week, I will leave and go outside and go, dang it, I left my sunglasses on my desk. And then I gotta come all the way back in, get my sunglasses and go all the way back out. Or I get all the way inside, I go to leave and I'm like, Ugh, I left my sunglasses in the car. I gotta walk out to the car and then I have them again. So that's why I have a million pairs of sunglasses. That's about enough about me, okay? My question of the week for you, parlaying off my latest question is, what are the everyday carry things that you have with you at all times? Of course, only what you're comfortable sharing, but I'm curious to know. Obviously, if it's pen related, that'd be super relevant, but I'm curious in general, just what are some of the other things that you'd like to have with you at all times on your person? That's it for this week. You can check out a lot of what I talked about here on GouletPens.com. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, interact, do all those things because it makes me happy and because it helps other people to see these great, great pen videos that we like to put out. Be sure to be on the lookout for Fountain Pen Day at us and around the general pen community because, again, it's all about fountain pens and celebrating the wonders that they are for us in our daily lives. Thank you so much for watching and 